If all these stories have you wanting to go on your own adventure and you don't want to spend a ton of money and you don't want to take a ton of time away from work and family, I highly encourage you to check out Lost Travel Company. They do trips all over the country, everything from biking to rafting to kayaking, hiking, etc. And on each trip, there's an official start line and an official finish line, but getting between locations is totally up to you. However you want to do it, however you want to carry your gear, it's a total free for all in between and, and and it is a group trip but they're very small groups uh so you get to know people but you can also easily practice social distancing so a lot of the trips are still happening and like i said uh they're very affordable very easy to get out and go do because they have figured out a lot of the logistics for you but it still leaves so much room for adventure to happen and with each trip they give back five percent of the total trip as a donation to the area where the trip is happening So if you'd like to find out more, go to lost.travel and use the code ADVENTUREsports for 10% off any of the trips listed. If you're suffering from stress, anxiety, lack of sleep, inflammation, pain management, kind of like I am pretty much all the time, I highly encourage you to check out cocanacare.com, and that's C-O for Colorado. It's a Colorado-based company, Canna, C-A-N-N-A, care.com. They make incredible CBD oil that's derived from all natural, high quality industrial hemp. It's legal in all 50 states and is USDA certified 100% organic. And there's absolutely no THC content in the oil. It's non GMO and contains no heavy metals or pesticides. They've been gracious enough to help support us during this time. So if you're wanting to try CBD oil for any of those reasons I mentioned and a lot more on their website, I uh, highly encourage you just to give it a shot. Check it out. Go to cocanacare.com. And again, and that's C O for Colorado, C A N N A care.com. This is the Adventure Sports Podcast, where we hear stories of adventure from every corner of the planet. We interview all sorts of folks who are using their sport to explore the world around them and give you the inspiration you need to get out there and have some fun. Hey friends, Kurt here. Thank you for listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast. Guess what? This is not a rerun. This is really me, the blast from the past. Mason is supporting a coast-to-coast ride, and he is kind of overwhelmed right now. And I said, hey, dude, may I do a couple of shows for you just for fun? And and he was all over it. So you get to hear my old voice. Sorry, guys. You're stuck with me for this episode. Today, I have guest Tanner Whiteford with us. And Tanner is an adventure enthusiast who does a lot of things. He's from North Carolina. He moved to the Gunnison, Colorado Valley in 2014. So he's been here for six years and he lives an adventure-based lifestyle. We want to talk about not only some of his adventure sports, but also how he's managed to create this adventure-based or based lifestyle. He uh, loves ski mountaineering, big mountains. He does a lot of mountain biking. As a matter of fact, he raced on the mountain biking team for Western. Uh, he's a trail runner, and he loves rafting as well, among other things. Tanner, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, man. So, yeah. It, it's always fun to talk to people who love adventure sports. Yeah. And that's what this show has always been about, and I've not recorded a show for the Adventure Sports Podcast for over two years now. Well, I haven't been on a, I've never been on a podcast, so I guess, you know, <laughs> that makes two of us almost. I'm, I'm excited to be here, so hopefully this goes great. All right. Well, let's mess it up together. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um. So first, Tanner, I'd like to give people uh, a bit of a context. So tell us your background. You grew up in North Carolina. Yeah. What was that like? Um, Growing up in North Carolina, it it was great. In North Carolina, it has, for for the East Coast, it has an amazing abundance of like, of of mountain biking, of rafting. It has a lot of, a lot of opportunities for people to get into the, to the outdoors. So I feel fortunate I grew up in a place like that. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't too far uh, in, removed from the action from sports or the, the adventure lifestyle, but I knew that like Colorado kind of hold it a little more, a little more opportunity for me from what I wanted to do. Skiing, mm. skiing was my biggest passion and I grew up watching matchstick production movies and, and oh, yeah. Warren Miller movies and stuff. So, um, so in high school, 
in Central North Carolina, I was a bit of the black sheep. I was that that guy that was like on the weekends driving straight to Boone, North Carolina, and sleeping in the back of my car when I was 16 and in the parking lot of Beach or Sugar Mountain and rock climbing every night. So, you know, people didn't really understand that kind of lifestyle. Right. Um, so when it came time to, to choose colleges, I, I did some research and I boiled it down to either Gunnison or Durango um, and ended up, you know, with... It was, it was funny, me and my dad went on a ski trip to Crest Butte, and we're driving back through, and I, it kind of dawned on me, and that was the first time I had skied Crest Butte, and I was like, you know what, this is this is the place I need to be. I think this is right where I belong, and that was six years ago. Fast forward now, I'm so happy I made that decision, and, and the past six years have been full of nothing but the wildest adventures I never expected I would I would even even ever get to, to experience, and uh, I, I just feel super blessed, yeah. Wow, that's cool. So you originally, when you made the move, you had college as a good excuse, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what I told my mom. <laughs> like, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to college, mom. And she, you know, <laughs> she didn't know I was, I was setting up my class schedule. Uh, so I'd have class on Tuesdays, Thursdays, all day, and then that meant Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I could go skiing or mountain biking or doing anything like that. So when she'd call and, hey, how's class going? Oh, it's going great, you know. Let me think. I'm, I'm keeping uh, up with it. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that one professor, yeah. Oh, no, he's great. But it, so that was that was super cool coming and, and going to college in a place that, like, you get a diff, just a, a complete in, in immersion into the, the outdoor lifestyle because you don't get that at many other colleges. And Western here in Gunnison was, hands down, yeah, the best choice I've ever made. Mm, great. You know, it's not always just um, the location. Mm-hmm. Western as a, as a school supports outdoor adventure a lot. Yes. And I think that that makes it really special too. But, you know, we were just joking about how many times Western's name had changed since you came here. <laughs> yeah. Tell that story. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah. So it was like, a, a for me, it seemed like every time I went home, someone's like, oh, where do you go to school? Oh, well, I go to Western State. Oh, wait, no, Western Colorado University. Oh, wait, you know, I'd, I'd have to change the, the name up a little bit. Cause, <laughs> and I think that was just part of, of Western, you know, finding its place in the new the new age of, of universities. You know, it's it was always known as Western State. And I think the whole Western State Colorado University is a is just a mouthful. And yeah, sure. I kind of like it. I like it better now being able to say Western Colorado University. That just rolls off the tongue a little nicer. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> definitely funny to start college um, at a specifically named school and then end it at some place completely different, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. That For those that don't know, uh, Western used to be Western State, right? And then it's gone through a couple of iterations, but recently it teamed up with CU, mm-hmm. University of Colorado, mm-hmm. and you can now get a engineering program from the University of Colorado at Western Colorado University, I think probably had a lot to do with that final name change. Yeah. And I think this one's going to stick for a long time. It's yeah. concise, and it does reflect that there's some cooperation between the two universities. Great opportunities here, brand new STEM building being built, um, fantastic school. My daughter goes to Western, mm-hmm. and you went to Western. I, I thought I'd throw that plug in because you can come to Gunnison, Colorado, and get a fantastic education on top of having fun. Yeah, right. I mean, a hundred percent. I I had a personal base, like a personal relationship with all my professors, and I don't. You're not going to get that really anywhere else. And yeah. So it would it would be funny, you know, you go and talk to your professor about a project, and then he just randomly asks, "Hey, what are you doing this weekend?" Oh, I'm I'm rafting the Upper Taylor. Oh, me too. Hey, you know, what time are you going? I'll see you out there. You know, 10 a.m. Cool. And you know, you find yourself on the river with with your accounting professor at 10 a.m. And it's it, I don't know. It just makes this. Really cool, unique experience. <laughs> it, it, was, is. it was sweet. It is. And it's fun, too, to be in an environment that is so health-focused. I mean, you mentioned how in North Carolina you were the weird guy because you were driving off on the weekends to get yeah. some rock climbing in. You know? yeah. um, in a lot of places around the United States, people are kind of waking up to adventure sports now. But for a long time, it was it was like, well, where are the adventurous places? And if you didn't live in a place like Colorado, maybe it was hard. But I'm glad now people are realizing you can do adventure sports anywhere. Yeah. Right? And but, I think it's it you know, it almost seems like it's becoming a little less taboo, you know. Oh yeah. For a while, I guess rock climbing seemed like it was this sport that was only for these select few 
people that had this knowledge base that no one else could acquire. Whereas now, you know, it would fortunately through the through the internet, anyone can learn to rock climb. You know, sure. YouTube for two hours. Go out with someone who maybe has some experience. Definitely not saying go out just your first time and teach. No, but don't do don't do that. But you know, a lot of people are getting a lot more access to it, and I think that's awesome. Yeah, lots of climbing gyms, indoor climbing mm-hmm. around the nation. It's it's booming. I mean, that's yeah. one example. I mean, when I was a kid, I grew up in northeastern Oklahoma, mm-hmm. and um, I, I was a road rider, and I remember one day riding by a, a guy I went to school with who just happened to be standing by the road there, and he yelled at me, man, you're an idiot. You're stupid. What are you doing? You know, because it yeah. was hot, and I was out there <laughs> cranking away up this big hill. But that was kind of the attitude at the time. Mm-hmm. People didn't know, but now they do. I mean, road biking is everywhere now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'm glad. Because people are learning to live healthier lifestyles to doing things that they love to do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so that's why you moved to Gunnison, Colorado, but you stayed. I did. Why, when you graduated from college, <laughs> yeah. why did you decide to stay? Um, I, you know, and Gunnison is a, is a it's a really unique place, but for a lot of the college students, I guess, afterwards, they, they just either moved back home or, you know, they, they decided that they wanted to go to... To, you know somewhere else but for me this this was home and I think I mean there's <laughs> there's two million acres of public land in Gunnison County so for me it, in the in my adventures lifestyle it made no 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 sense to move out of the valley so um, yeah I stayed because well for instance I can ski 12 months of the year <laughs> there's not many places else in the country unless you're in the Pacific Northwest where you can really make that happen and be in right smack in the middle of what is it? Four major mountain ranges of Colorado. They call this oh, the yeah. base camp of the Rockies. You know, I I can I can be in the San Juans in, in an hour. I can be in the Elks in thirty minutes. I can you know so, it, just it just the the availability to all the outdoors. I uh, you know it, that was probably the majority of it. But the other part of it is that I just love this community. It's it's that small town mountain vibe still. Um, it hasn't been overrun. It doesn't feel like you're in Aspen with a Louis Vuitton store on every corner. Or, um, you know, just all these bougie restaurants and everything. It's it's got the home the homely body feel of of small town North Carolina, but stuck at eight thousand feet in the middle of the mountains. It's it's a really cool place, and and I couldn't find myself to leave. Well, I came here for the same reason, yeah. Tanner. You know, so <laughs> I'm with you. It actually, it might be kind of fun to just give a little bit of detail on that. Yeah. So I was inter- interviewing Kate Rao, who's mm-hmm. a director of the Colorado portion of NICA for the Colorado High School Mountain Biking League cycling league. So anyway, um, after the interview, which was fantastic, I said, well, who else should I interview? And she says, well, Dave Weens. Yeah. And so he was helping with the league at the time. So I called up Dave. He goes, yeah, I'll be on. So I interviewed Dave Weens and he was talking about how much he loved not only Western because at the time he was working with their mountain sports. Um, but also he was talking about Gunnison and how great it was and all the things you could do here. And I was like, what? Because I had always driven through Gunnison on the way to other places. Yeah. I admit it. And I think a lot of people do that. It's a small town, and you can be on Highway 50 and just blow right through because you're on your way to somewhere else. Mm. You know, and I never stopped and looked around. Um, Gunnison is kind of high alpine desert on the fringe of the forest. Most people think of Colorado mountain towns as being in the forest. Mm -hmm. But there's some real advantages to not being in the forest. Yeah. (laughs) You know? Um, but it's so close to everything. That base camp of the Rockies really is true. Mm-hmm. You can do, man, almost any Colorado mountain sport you can do from Gunnison, and everything is right here. So you can do it right after work. You don't have to yeah. plan a day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I moved here because of that. Uh, after visiting with Dave Weens and some other people from the Valley, I started realizing, man, there are a lot of really great adventurers in this Valley, and, mm-hmm. and I wanted to go check it out. So my wife and I came out, looked at it, and said, sold. Yeah, no so, brainer almost. <laughs> no brainer. Yeah. We're here. And, I've got uh, yeah that, and yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, That's good. I was gonna say I've got um, a prime example of that base camp of the Rockies kind of story. So uh, last year, about July, or it was just before this time last year, my buddy and I. He's a he's a famous, very really great photographer up in Crested Butte. We just were were on a Wednesday. We're like, hey man, you know, what do you want to do this weekend? Well. I don't know. I kind of want to do a little bit of everything. And so we had then sat down and mapped out this multi-day or this multi-sport um, adventure for one day. And so within, within one day, we wanted to be able to ski, mountain bike, dirt bike, rock climb, 
stand up paddleboard the Gunnison River and go out for a little time at the shooting range. And so <laughs> we kind of mapped it out. And we're like, this is totally feasible. And we weren't doing small, small feats of like mountain biking. We weren't just going to mountain bike, you know, a one mile stretch. We wanted to do, do make it worth it. So um, that Friday night before we, we drove up in his four wheel drive pickup truck all the way up to the top of Paradise Divide beautiful area. I mean, you're looking, you're overlooking all of the Elk Mountains. You can see the Maroon Bells, you can see Crest Butte, you can see the light coming from Aspen. It was gorgeous in the Milky Way all at one time. Nice. And we just found a nice patch of dirt, threw down our sleeping bags and, and bivvied right there in the dirt. Woke up the next morning at, I don't know, 5, 5 a.m. and hiked up, um, hiked up one of the peaks right near there, skied this dog ear, you know, looking shape of snow, and uh, it was a decent amount of turns for, for late July. It's 4 a.m., you, you just get this awe, you're like, all right, here we go, we're about to do this, and um, get done from that, we throw on some ACDC, we just drive as fast as we can down to Crest Butte in his pickup truck. We pull, we pull up to Gothic, and we throw the mountain bikes into, our, into the back of his pickup truck. We then pedal up and do the whole 401 trail, Get done with that. We're immediately running back to his house. We grab two paddle boards. We then just drive as fast as we can, go on the speed limit, down to Gunnison, jump in the jump in the river, and we paddle board the whole Gunnison River town stretch. Get out of there. We throw the dirt bikes on the back of our of our cars. We haul butt out to to Hartman Rocks, which is this cool um, high desert kind of. It, we call it Mini Moab, right outside of town. It's like two miles outside of Gunnison, and we dirt biked almost 40 miles that afternoon, got done, went for a sun or for a sunset uh, session out at the shooting range and shot off a couple of shotgun shells and then went for a moonlight rock climb. And that was all within 24 hours of itself. And needless to say, by the time we were done, we, we were exhausted. But in Gunnison, you can do that. And I think that's, yeah, that's probably the, the best thing. Yeah, that was, that was a, the highlight of my summer last summer. That was great. That's fantastic. There aren't many places that you can do that kind of stuff, but this is one of the few where you can, and, yeah. and it's all here. Yeah. It's not like, well, I, I skied today. Yeah. You know, it's, it's all here. Yeah. I, earlier this summer, we decided to go backpacking, but we decided we wanted a mountain bike first. So we did a 25-mile ride, got a couple thousand verts in, and then came home, grabbed our packs, and went, um, backpacking and spent the night on a high mountain lake and did some fishing. And yeah. Same sort of a thing. You find yourself doing, you call them biathlons if you want to, or quadathlons or pentathlons. <laughs> you know, you make it up. You make yeah. your own game, and it's a lot of fun. It is. So you've kind of zeroed in on ski mountaineering as your main sport. Yeah, backcountry skiing and, and ski mountaineering. Um, I, I guess, well, because that's Growing up, what shaped me into being the outdoor athlete that I was was my dad took me to a Warren Miller movie when I was, I don't know, 14 years old. And until that point, I was just your standard old, you know, soccer playing American kid that really was, I, I didn't really have any direction, you know. Um, granted, I was 12 or 14, I can't remember, so I shouldn't have had direction. But as soon as I saw that, I don't know what it was, but some some flip just switched in my head. And I was like, all right, from this point forward... I want to be a skier, and I was ordering ski movie after ski movie, just nerding out, watching these films all summer, and then it'd come time, like I said, when I turned 16, I was up in Boone, North Carolina, I mean, that's a two and a half, three hour drive from where I lived, and I'd sleep in my car at the, at the, in the parking lots there, and just ski, 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 came out here, and it was, once again, I was like, holy cow, this is, this is, I don't have to sleep in my car, first off, which is nice. But second off, we're in we're in this huge playground. So I immediately, my freshman year, went and took my Avalanche 1 certification, got that out of the way, um, started acquiring from thrift stores or from um, ski swaps, however I could, the cheapest way possible, get all my backcountry equipment, and just fully enveloped myself into this backcountry lifestyle because the resort is amazing. And I love skiing Crest Butte, but there's some kind of... Um, you know, it was it was just this beaconing in my head that was like, the backcountry is a much bigger playground. It it just opens up this whole world out here, and um, yeah. So I guess over the years, I skied my first fourteener my freshman year with with some of my buddies, and we had all gotten our Abbey One certifications. And as you know, we were we were standing on top of Mount Princeton, which is in Buena Vista, and sure, um, it's not far. Yeah, it's easy to when you drive from Denver, you're like, holy cow, what is that mountain? So that was one that has just been beaming in my head, and I'm standing up there going, man, this is what I want to do. So from that point forward, it was it was game on. And um, ever since then, I've skied 
eight fourteeners, but I can't tell you how many countless other, um, you know, 13,000 foot peaks and 12,000 foot peaks. I mean, it's just endless around here. So it, it's become such a part of my life that now I've, I've just kind of taken on this challenge to try and ski as many months of the year every year that I can. Um, for three years, I was going on every month of the year. I mean, I didn't miss a month. And I, it, so you got 36 months? Yeah, 36 months straight. Nice. Um, and then <laughs> last year, I ended up going on a big international trip for a month. So missed one month. And I was like, ah. Oh. You know, Thailand was great, but I still didn't ski in June, so that was a little rough. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's such an addiction. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's awesome. But it's a healthy addiction. I guess, yeah, I don't know, definitely. Well, uh, yeah, I guess sometimes, you, you know, <laughs> you take one of those cliff hucks a little too big, put your knee in your mouth, and you're like, oh, yeah. I should have taken up golf. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have to do that. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's, uh, kind of an amazing thing there are depending on how you count between 54 and 58 14ers in colorado which Mm -hmm. is a lot of tall mountains to ski we're the high we have the highest mean elevation of any state in the in the u.s yeah yep i believe it amazing Um, what people don't often realize about colorado is there are over 700 peaks that are above 13 yeah (laughs) yeah so in a 13er feels like a 14er it's a Mm -hmm. very big mountain so if you want tall mountains to ski or climb I mean, there's a lifetime of of mountains here. Yeah, for you. You know, it's not just the 14ers, which are fantastic, but the 13ers as well. And do you know the Kinsellas? The uh, who? Uh, the Kinsellas were among the first to ski all 58. Oh. I believe they did the eight instead of the four, mm-hmm. but of the 14ers. So they're up in wow. CB, Crested oh, Butte. Really? Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. They've yeah. been on the show a couple of times, ah. but. They have some really neat stories to tell about it, and they've written some books on different routes and stuff like that. So mm. check them out. Pretty yeah. cool stuff. Um, ski mountaineering. I'm glad you mentioned the Abbey course. Mm-hmm. You said, so my freshman year, the first thing I did, that's the right way to go about it. It is, yeah. <laughs> right? There's a right way and a wrong way. And fortunately around here, there's a huge there's a huge community of everyone who backcountry skis. That's the first question they'll ask you when you're getting into it. Did you get your Abbey one? Do you have your Beacon Shovel Pro? Like, are you are you prepared in some sort of aspect, because, yeah. and Abby One did a great job of just scaring the life into you. They're like, listen, <laughs> the, you know, these mountains are no joke, and it's it's crazy to think the San Juans, just an hour south of us here, the most avalanche-prone mountain range in North America. Right. You'd think Alaska or British Columbia, Canada, or, you know, somewhere like that would, would have greater risk, but no, it's it's just our weird weather patterns, our our high, high altitude, and, and you know, just the steepness and of these mountains around here. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. It's I mean, terrifying, too. <laughs> Colorado is known for a champagne powder. Mm-hmm. And it's wonderful in the resort to ski that when you catch a storm at the right time and you're floating on a couple of feet of that. It's, oh, yeah. it's a life experience. But that same champagne powder is a reason why we have such high avalanche danger. And mm-hmm. it's, be, it's because, like on the West Coast, the, uh, the snow comes in, warmer temperatures, it packs down, it doesn't slide. Not normally. They do have avalanches. Don't get oh, me yeah. wrong. But here in Colorado, the snow comes in light, but it still gets deep and heavy. And because it's less stable and we have high angles, mm-hmm. you know, um, yeah, we we have crazy avalanche issues. We lost a local guy last winter. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, it does happen. And, and I don't mean to make people, you know, think, oh, well, I would never do that. People die doing that. No, if you know what you're doing and you avoid avalanche terrain, and uh, then it really is very, very safe. If you look at the stats, it's safer than driving a car. And it's a, an amazing way to encounter nature. It is. You know? Contrast for us. I mean, I almost did, but I'd rather you do it for us. Contrast for us how it's different than skiing at the resort. So, yeah. Uh, I love that question because skiing in general is a, always a blast. And by no means do I want to make it seem like backcountry skiing is, is better but it's just different. And um, skiing at the resort, it's great because all day, every, you know, every turn, every every lap, you're just skiing your heart out. Yeah. But the taking the time to slow down and get out there amongst these giants, I mean, these peaks that are twice as big as the resort in itself. Sure. And you're starting at the bottom, and it's 4 a.m., your headlamp's on, you can see the stars out, and you're like, wow, I have like 5,000 feet to climb in order to just get one one run that you would get at the resort. And that's for a lot of people might seem horrible. That doesn't sound fun, but 
at the same time, when you're halfway up that mountain and it's 5 a.m. and and uh, the sun's peeking over the horizon, and all you can hear is your breath because you're just breathing your heart out, you do get this sense of euphoria, and it, it makes you feel so much more in tune with the mountains and in tune with Mother Nature because you're, you're listening. You're like listening for, for shifting snowpacks. You're listening, listening and, and looking at how the wind is blowing, and, and you're just reading the mountain in a whole other way that you never really pay attention to whenever you're on the resort. So you get this heightened sense of... of of what the mountains are doing, but you get a heightened sense of like how how you're interacting with nature, and it's it's such a unique experience. But then the other plus side is you're coming down a mountain that hasn't been skied at all. So you when you when you see those ski movies and you watch some guy or girl taking these turns at you know 40 miles an hour, and there's not a single track in front of them to throw them off, and it almost looks like they're floating. I'll tell you, it it does feel like you're floating. You're flying in a in a sense. It's it's amazing. I love it. Yeah, and so the at the ski resorts, you need to be in the first run or two if you want to catch the pal without tracks, mm-hmm. right, which is hard to do. Yeah. When you're ski mountaineering, you can get pal almost every time. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's all there for you. And if you could ski the same mountain 10 times in a day, you would have 10 untouched runs in yeah. the same yeah, day. Yeah, exactly. You know? yeah. So it, it's an amazing thing. Uh, it does take a special skill set, mm-hmm. you know. Knowing avalanche danger, knowing route finding, understanding mm-hmm. how to avoid hypothermia, what you're going to do if you get lost or stuck out there. You know, no one's out there sweeping the slopes to make sure that you got off the mountain in time. It's up to you. And I think that that in in a way is also what appeals. You know, it's 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 you. You know, there's no one else going to be out there to rescue you, and that just makes you feel alive. I don't I don't know if people call it an adrenaline addiction or what, but. It's there's something about that self sufficiency that if right. something, things go wrong, it ha- you have to be the one to get yourself out of that situation, and that too it just makes you feel so small and it humbles you, but at the same time it makes you feel so alive. It's awesome. You know, I didn't prep you for this, but I used to ask a question <laughs> hmm. e- even years before I passed the baton to to Mason to host the show. Um, tell us about a time when something went wrong. And it was always my favorite question to ask, and we've not been asking it as much lately, so. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll tell you about a time when something could have gone horribly wrong. Okay. And it was a big wake-up call for, for me and some of my backcountry partners was uh, we were skiing Mount Snuffles down in the San Juans. and Yep. Um, epic mountain. Epic. It's, it's, <laughs> epic. I actually mountain. have a tattoo of the coordinates on my arm right here. It's, <laughs> right it's, on. it's my favorite mountain. I love oh, it. Oh man, it's yeah, gorgeous. Epic. You see it from everywhere in Southwest Colorado. It's it just stands out. Yeah, you can see it from uh, Signal Peak right over here. Yeah, yeah, just it, barely, just barely, just the top of it. I actually <laughs> noticed that a few weeks ago. I was like, oh, that's my cool. Gosh, that's that's yep. snuffles. But so after you know wanting to ski that for years, we finally pulled the trigger and it was everything just lined out the the Abbey conditions. We're looking good for for you know a week or two leading up to it. The weather patterns were looking great, um, and it was like now or never. It's like this is the time we're going to ski it. Or we're not really going to ski it, and so um, it was actually February. Normally, people ski mm. that in in later um, spring, like May but, or June. Yeah, or something. And, yeah, and we wanted to kind of do it in a u- unique way in the middle of of winter, which maybe call us young and dumb. We were <laughs> I don't know twenty one, twenty two, all of us, and. We Invincible, approached, of yeah, course. Yeah, of course. And that's, that's yeah, and I think that's the mentality that, that we had, which was, you know, you look back and you, you think, how ignorant can you be? But we, we started from Uray, which was the, a real long approach, and all the way up Yankee Boy Basin Road, um, which is from from where they had the gate locked. <laughs> they they plow from the gate up to Camp Bird Mine, which is like okay. four miles. So we didn't anticipate that. And we had expected we could just throw on the skins and skin our way. But we ended up having to walk in our ski boots with our skis on our shoulders. Because it was plowed. For, yeah, because it was plowed. And there's no room. You know, it's a cliff edge on the side yeah, of the road. Is. And so <laughs> that was our first, like, what the heck, man? We should have looked into this a little more. Yeah. But um, anyhow, we we made it all the way up into the basin, camped out way like above tree line in the middle of February. It was awesome, but it was the coldest, one of the coldest nights of my life. Um, yeah. Just hunkered down. You're in, you know... a 
two person tent with three guys just all shivering and you sleep in your ski boots cuz they'll freeze if you yeah. if you take them off that night so you're soaking wet it's miserable but at the same time that's why they call it type 2 fun you're still loving it <laughs> <laughs> so wake it's up it's more fun to remember than to be there maybe so, yeah it's fun to talk about it on a podcast that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> that's it <laughs> But um, wake up the next morning, we, we climb up the chimney shoe, we make it up there, and, and it was everything lined out. I mean, it was it was beautiful, and I think it was one of my, one of the most vivid times I can remember just being on top of the world, because that was always one of my favorite mountains. When you're up there, it's cool, because you're above everything in the San Juans. It's, it's an amazing experience. So we ski down, everything goes great, and one of the last steeper sections coming down into the Yankee Boy Basin, where our camp was... Um, at that point, I was exhausted. Everyone was exhausted. And instead of trying to make, you know, some, some quicker, tighter turns, I just decided to open it up and straight line it out of there. So I don't know. I must have been going 60 miles an hour and uh, maybe even faster. I'm just straight lining. And I had my. I remember having my arms out wide. I was loving it. I wasn't lo- really looking exactly down. I was looking at the view more so. But I hit a rock buried by about an inch or two Uh-oh. of snow. So hard and so fast that the go and I have a GoPro video of it, but I immediately tomahawked like maybe seven times. I mean, just end over, end over, end over, right. end, just violently. And the the video of me, I I mean, I kind of remember it, but it went by so fast. I look at the the GoPro video to kind of you know get a better picture. You stop; it's all just dead quiet. And I pulled my helmet off. And turned the GoPro around at me, and thankfully there's no blood or anything like that. Helmet's cracked to pieces. Oh. And my skis are just torn to shreds. The whole bases of them got ripped. I mean, completely ripped out. And mm. thankfully I wasn't hurt, and that could have been really bad. But I think the big, that was like the, one of the biggest wake-up calls. And I've always been terrified of rocks ever since then. Whether that's at the resort, yeah. backcountry, anyways. Because I just think, you know, if, if I'd have hit other rocks after that while I was tumbling or... I would have cracked my skull or something like that. We mm-hmm. were so far removed from the from civilization that even even if someone would have been able to climb back up to the highest ridge point near us and grab cell service, it would have been four hours. You know, yeah, easy. Um, and four and hours would have been death. I found out this weekend that the average rescue time for mountain rescue is six hours. Yeah, and in certain situations, that's that that is way too long you know so 4 hours to get the call out mm-hmm. 3 to 6 more hours for help to show up yep this is this is no joke yeah this is the real deal when you're in the back country it's the real deal yeah and and that that was my that was a wake up call cuz it's like i i i just became kind of like you said what you th- invincible in a way we thought we had yeah. skied so many 14ers that we knew what we were doing and we we damn well were going to ski this one and nothing was going to go wrong and it did. Luckily, I was okay, but it could have gone so much worse. And, and yeah. I just hold that that story super super close to my heart, and I always think about that. You know, I interviewed John Fielder. Good grief, it was it was probably two thousand five. No, I mean fifteen, not five. Two thousand fifteen. And I asked him the same question. I said, "Tell us about a time that something went wrong, because you might help somebody. They'll learn from what you said, and then you might save a life." And he said, that's not the way it works. And I'm like, okay, what do you mean by that, John? And, and he says, no, you got to get out there and make the mistakes and screw up to really learn. Mm-hmm. He yeah. said, that, that's really what happens because everyone thinks they're invincible until they mess up. Yeah. And I thought, boy, you know, hopefully we can learn from the experiences of others. But the reality is... Sometimes you have to hit that rock going too fast and tomahawk down a mountain. Yeah. You know, and yep. then you're like, oh, yeah, that's what they're talking about, right? Yep. So I'm glad that you're okay. I love that. That looks awesome. Yeah, because, I mean, please yield the warnings, but at the same time, that's why that's why we all we all go out there and do it because you learn every time you go out about something, either about yourself internally or you learn about the sport itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's great because, yeah, I've had to learn a lot of tough lessons. <laughs> and, yep. and I think I wouldn't have learned them without it being tough and me having to experience it. <laughs> yep, yep. And, you know, I think anyone who's skied much has hit that rock that's hidden under an inch of powder. And yeah. and when you do that and it just about yanks your ski off or your leg off and you go yeah. flying, you realize, oh, that's what they're talking about. Yeah. Unmarked yeah. obstacles and yeah. what have yeah. you. You know, it, it's it's the real deal. What a beautiful thing to do, though. Mm-hmm. So get a little bit more um, introspective here. 
What do you think that an adventure-focused lifestyle has done for Tanner Whiteford? I think it's it's focused my my focused my life in a way that I I never anticipated. Um, it being focused, you know, when I was a kid, I always wanted to be in the military. <laughs> I just grew up in a military family, and yep. um, I was diagnosed with a, a genetic arthritis that then de- DQ'd me from military service. So I was immediately like, "How do I find this next like passion? How do I find something that's gonna keep me focused, keep me healthy, keep me alive?" I guess in a, in a sense, and that was action sports. And so, um, Gunnison, Colorado, I think living here is it's. It's the mecca for everything outdoors. And if I didn't live here, I don't really know how I would be able to pursue this type of lifestyle that really is the only thing that keeps me alive. Um, you know, I, yeah, I don't know. Um, well, you know, you mentioned this um, genetic arthritis. Is that what it is? Yeah. It's called so, ankylosing spondylitis. Okay, say that again for us. Ankylosing spondylitis. Yeah. <laughs> so it's AS is is for short. They, it. I almost thought the doctor was lying to me when he first said I had it. I was like, that, there's no way that's real. That sounds fake. That sounds made up. So explain what that is. It's it's a form of, um, uh, it's, well, it's an autoimmune disease. So what it is, is uh, okay. it's hyperactive, your, hyper, your immune system's hyperactive and it attacks healthy cells within the body. But AS specifically targets your, your hips and lower back. Um, so you get massive amounts of inflammation, so much so that, uh, over time, it creates bone growth between your vertebrae mm. and will fuse your spine Spurs together. and fusions. Yep. And, um, and so I'm, I'm on a medication, luckily, that helps suppress that. Uh, but still, even still, there's times, there's a few weeks out of the year, I'll just get hit with some flare-up. And I don't know what causes it, and really the doctors don't either. But, I, you know, I'm bedridden. I can't get out of bed. I can't, I can't walk. If I do walk... I run the risk of like falling. And I mean, it's, it's like those life alert commercials, you know, help I've mm. fallen and I can't get up. And it's true, you yeah. know, and I'm 24 years old. So it can definitely put a damper on your spirit sometimes, which is why anytime I'm feeling, I'm feeling good. I'm, I'm like, I got to go, you know, this is my time to be skiing as much as I can climbing, rafting, whatever it is. I feel an urgency to kind of get out there, which in a, in a way, you know, you can, you can sit back and go all oh, poor me. You know, I've got this, this, genetic arthritis why why would i be given this but it almost motivates me more to like all right well now i'm feeling good i've got to do it and you know before i get too old and this disease might overcome me i've got to, i've got to do everything and experience everything so yeah. wow you can kind of see it as a blessing i guess in some ways well let's hope yeah that that never happens yeah right but I, there is one rule if i've learned anything from interviewing hundreds of guests over the years People that keep overcoming the challenges are the ones that are able to do it the longest. I mean, they're the ones who, I mean, I, I, I know a bunch of guys in the Valley here who in their 60s, even 70s, they're still going strong. Why? Because they never stopped. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And in life, everybody has challenges. And I'm not trying to say that yours is less or bigger than someone else's. I'm just saying that everyone has challenges. And... We got a lot of questions over the years about why do you spend so much time on adventure sports? Are you guys just interviewing people about having fun? Life is more than fun, right? It's just a bunch of hedonism. Mm -hmm. We can't all just go out and have fun all the time. And, you know, I I did an episode years ago about the reason that we promote adventure sports. And absolutely it's for the fun. Yeah. (laughs) But, you know, it's also about having a healthy lifestyle. It is. And if you find something that you love to do and you do it and you stay active and you stay healthy, then you're better in the other areas of your life, mm-hmm. right? You're, you're better at work. You're better with your family. Not only that, but you teach your, your kids how to be healthy and they teach their kids how to be healthy. Mm-hmm. And I recently saw a statistic that 60% of the United States is obese now. Yeah. And obesity is no joke. Mm-hmm. It's debilitating and it's dangerous. And uh, if we can promote adventure sports and people are healthier as a result of that, Mm -hmm. and they can live richer, more fulfilling lives and provide that lifestyle example for their family, for their friends, then I think that that's a big win. Yeah. You know? And And go ahead. Well, I, you know, I I think just as much for the physical um, well-being and healthiness of our population, mental health recently has become a huge 
it, it's become more prevalent. People are taking it more seriously. And um, we're, we live in a society that's so consumed by by your phone and by kind of viewing or, or um, yeah, seeing yourself through the lens of someone else. You know, you, mm. you go online and, oh, man, my, you know, the kids I went to high school with are getting married and have kids and why isn't my life like that? Or, you know, why, why do I not live like this rich kid who has a Ferrari on, on Instagram, <laughs> right. you know? And it can almost overwhelm you so much that you don't ever t- take the time to look and see what you want to do individually. Yeah. And a lot of people... I think of, or at least a lot of, a lot of people around here don't really look to Instagram to be that inspiration. You know, right. they're, they're living, they're out here living their own life and they're, they're doing things that make them happy. And those, those things that are making them happy are also physically healthy for them. And that, that, that creates such a, a great lifestyle for your physical fitness, your mental fitness and everything in between that, that. You're the I, I you know the level of 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 a uh, of lifestyle here is just unmatched. I mean, you know, everyone around here seems happy, and it's. I'm not saying that people don't have their own, you know, the standard, normal American issues, but in general, I see more people smiling here than I think I do in, in many other places, and I that is that is all attested to the the outdoor lifestyle that everyone lives. I believe. Yeah, there's a lot. A lot to say there. And I'm going to show the dark side of that just for a minute because I, I believe in balance. There's also, a, it's a small issue, but it's a very real issue in the Valley. People who can't keep up yeah. kind of feel left out. Yeah. You know? And so I think we all have to be aware of that mm-hmm. and plan trips with people that are learning and who yeah. need that encouragement, you know, along the way so everyone can participate. And, you know, if you're someone who's just starting out in an adventure sport, you found something you love, then realize, you know, you're not going to be a giant in the sport right away, but you've adopted something that can carry you through the many years of life and make you healthier and and make life so much more rich and fulfilling. And don't be discouraged. These sports take a long time to learn. They do. They're hard. Yeah. They're complex. They're technical, but they are so rewarding. And the level of professionalism has gotten so high these days. Yeah. You know, I've always been uh, a huge fan of of just having fun with everything you do. Skiing, I think, has become one of those sports that's taken so seriously these days. And, and, <laughs> Too seriously. Yeah, and, yeah. and all, the whole reason you that for skiing is to have fun. So yeah. with with anything you do outdoors, my, my number one rule is if you're not having fun, you better stop and just really reassess and go, what what am I doing? Because the first yeah. and foremost, you know, I need to be out here having fun. Um, even if that is sleeping in a tent at 2 a.m. when it's negative 20 and your boots, your boots are frozen to your feet, that still should be fun, you know? And I, I think it is for the most part. So as long Montana, as those are what good you words. make it. Yeah, those are good words. I recently have been a little bit discouraged because I'm 52 years old, even though I'm actually 23. Everyone knows <laughs> if they've listened to the podcast for long that I'm 23. Um, my sons race mountain bikes, and uh, I've been trying to keep up with them. And at first, I was leading them, teaching them how to ride. And little by little, they started keeping up. And then they started surpassing me. And now they are so much better than I am. I feel like I'm just croaking out there, you know. (laughs) And so I'm always trying to keep up. And it was starting to be a little bit of a a downer for me. So I'm taking the words that you're sharing seriously. Yeah. I make myself stop on the trail and look around and see where I am and remember what I'm doing. And then a big smile comes across my face. And I say, okay. I'm actually stronger than I've ever been. They're just better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, this is really a great thing to be doing. Mm-hmm. I have to do that kind of attitude check. Yeah. You know, to make sure that I don't get too competitive. Yeah. I don't let what other people are doing mess with my fun. Yeah. Right. And actually, that's how people get hurt. Oh, it is. You know, people get hurt because they see someone else do something that they actually aren't ready to do yet, and then they think they have to try it. So don't do that. Ride your own ride, hike your own hike, ski yeah. your own slope. I mean, you are. <laughs> You're in charge of your fun and your own safety. Right? It, it's and I think <laughs> I see that so much here in, in the valley too, especially in Crested Butte. And yeah. I hate it whenever you're coming down and you think you're doing great. I mean, you're on your you know each turn are are dialed and you're feeling amazing. Yep. And then some eight year old comes skiing down that looks like a little I call them garden gnomes because they're they're they, <laughs> they're in bright little colored clothing and they look like garden gnomes and it he'll send a three sixty off a cliff that you weren't even gonna think about hitting and you're like well. Damn, you know, <laughs> I thought I was good, and now, now, you know, that's a reality check. But once again, stop, reassess, look out at the mountains, yep. and go, 
I'm where I want to be. I'm having fun. That's, yeah. yeah, and you awesome. know what? It's also cool to be in a place where you can meet amazing, amazing people. Yeah. Um, it's not uncommon here to go on a bike ride or to a hike or something, and then someone mentions because people don't brag much around here, but someone mentions that that person was Olympian, you know, got a, oh. a silver medal or that you know, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. You go, oh. We're actually with the Giants, yeah, you know, yeah. and everyone is just out there having fun, exactly. which is a beautiful thing. Hey, let's yeah. talk about how you manage to live in a place like this, because mountain communities are expensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, job opportunities are not great. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm starting a new company. I'm going to talk about that a little bit, too. And, and we're all sorting out the way to be where we love to be. Mm-hmm. What is your formula for that? My formula? Well, and... Wow, that you know that that's and those are all great points for a mountain community. So, let's kind of back up. You know, I'm in college, I graduate, and it's left with this big um, dilemma. You know, do I do I leave this beautiful valley that I've called home and come to love in yeah. pursuit of a career option that's going to be feasible for you know my financial goals for the future, yep. or do I stick around in pursuit of my my hobbies and my um, my passion for life and and try and make it work. And so um, I chose the latter. I chose, you know, what my the the level of happiness and my passions for life shouldn't shouldn't have to take a sacrifice for for my career choices, right. um, which was tough because for about two years I worked as a, a carpenter and I love being a carpenter here in the valley. Um, and it was great, you know. Definitely in the winter months when it's cold, that was I was questioning Tough. myself a little bit. But yep. eventually, I knew that I didn't want to be a carpenter. I didn't go to school for that, and that wasn't my my avenue. Um, so fortunately, I was able to start working with Matchstick Productions, uh, which was great because that was what that, they got me into skiing. You know, watching all their movies as a kid and everything just got me fired up. So that was a, a huge stepping stone for me. And then I, I kept piecing it together between working at Vale. Staying at Matchstick, being a carpenter, I, I knew that I was kind of funneling towards something that was going to be bigger. And fortunately, fortunately for me, this past uh, this past summer, I was able to kind of find my avenue. And that's that's actually here at the Ice Lab here in Gunnison. Um, the Ice Lab stands for the innovation for the Innovation, Creativity, and Entrepreneurship Lab here in Gunnison. And that's essentially what we're trying to do. And what this place is is it's a co working space and a startup uh, space for businesses in the Valley. So uh, it's a great way for people on vacation to come in and get work done in a, in a productive environment with access to printers, phones, computers, anything you need while you're on vacation. It's awesome. It's all right here. And I kind of manage the co-working space and, and um, help all of the members of our, of our community here um, get what they need done, which is an amazing job. And then we also have the startup side of the Ice Lab, which is we are working, we are working to to create a space where anyone in the valley that has that entrepreneurial spirit and that that business startup drive has a great foundation and a great resource to get that up and going. So together, we're hoping all together the Ice Lab's hoping to to create a more create those those other jobs um, mm, within the valley. Yeah. We want to create those higher paying jobs here in Gunnison that that allow college students when they graduate from Western to not have to make that difficult choice. Um, and I feel I feel I feel really blessed to be in a position that I can make that happen. So yeah, living in a mountain community can can be tough. Um, but I think we're seeing a, a different wave these days of um, with the on, onslaught of COVID-19, a lot of jobs have been going remote and sure. remote permanently. Um, I know that Twitter and Facebook and a lot of these huge companies have all said, you know, our, our workers are going to be permanently remote now. Wow. And so um, I think this is the, if there's any opportunity or if there's ever been an opportunity for people to move to a, a cool mountain town like Gunnison, now's your chance because... If you're able to work remotely and you have access to some some place like the Ice Lab where you can come in, we even have office space available for people to rent. You can you can come in and and move to a valley like this while having that security of knowing there's a place where you can get all your work done, have all the resources you need to to be successful at your job still, um, while being able to leave out of the backside of the office here and go for a 22 mile mountain bike ride if you want. It's it's really special. So. You know what? I was just getting ready to say, forget about vacation. Because of COVID, you're not going into the office anyway. Yeah. Come to Gunnison and grab a campsite, grab a room somewhere, and come to the Ice Lab 
and you can do your work here. You mm-hmm. don't have to worry about where am I going to find the internet? Is it is you know the coverage going to be good enough? All that kind of stuff. So come to the Ice Lab. They have punch cards that are very affordable. You can rent a space month to month, whatever, and you can get your work done here and then do what I do, yeah. which is go on that mountain bike ride in the afternoon right after work. You know. Yeah. Are you coming Wednesday? Or are we going on the on the ride Wednesday? I think I'm going to be with the Nike team. Ah, okay. But we'll see. I'm going to All talk right. to the coach. I might be here Wednesday. So we do a Wednesday ride, which is a lot of fun. Yeah. So I and Tanner mentioned that it's also Ice Lab supports startups. And I have to say, um, they really do. So my new company, I've mentioned on the podcast when Mason interviewed me a, a few months ago, but is Pod Divi. And we provide advertising for pre-huge podcasts. So most smaller podcasts really struggle to get ad revenue. I get that. And it makes it hard to keep your podcast going. And I have a solution for that. So anyway, the Ice Lab has been helping me get PodDivi going. And I honestly don't think I would have made nearly as much progress without the encouragement and advice and support that I've gotten here it's been fantastic. So it's a great place. If you have an idea that you want to pursue with a startup, the Ice Lab also helps with that. And they've been helping me a lot. So, sure. And you podcasters out there, I know you're listening. If you want ad revenue, then see Linville at poddivvy.com or just go to poddivvy.com. That's two Ds and two Vs. I'm trying to get it down to a jingle. P A no, let's see. P O W D I V W U. I can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll work on that after this. Okay. Uh, that, anyway, that. that's a tongue twister for me, but you can find me there and I can help out. So anyway, Tanner, I like what the Ice Lab is doing, and I'm glad that you're on board here now. Yeah. And that that's provided you a way to live in Gunnison and continue pursuing the lifestyle that you love. That balanced life. It's a life of health, and I just say more power to you, man. Yeah, thank you. I, you know, and I, I just, I hope that uh, the, everyone listening can can find that same or that has this same type of passion for the outdoors, can find an, an avenue and a way for them to to make a lifestyle and make a career in a small mountain town like this. So if you're if you're struggling at all too, um, and maybe you don't even live in in Gunnison, and maybe you're in another mountain town, and and you're you're like, man, I, you know, I'm tired of just being a server in the winter months and a carpenter in the summer, you know, anything like that. And yep. I want to kind of pursue a different job. Please give us a call here at the ice lab. You know, we're not, we don't want to just be all, you know, we only work with Gunnison. We work with, we, we want to see mountain communities succeed. So give me a call. I'd love to see, um, you know, if we could help you in any way, um, call the ice lab, just Google the ice lab or give me a call um, at, uh, can I give my phone number? Is that, yeah. That's up to you. Okay. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, Go no, I mean, yeah, give me a call at 336-689-7172. Um, Say it again. Yeah, 336-689-7172. I'd love to, I'd love to, to see how we can help you guys, um, you know, make this lifestyle in the mountains as successful as possible because it's, it's the best lifestyle there is, in my opinion. <laughs> well, hey, it works for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Tanner, thanks so much for coming on the Adventure Sports Podcast. And I also want to say a special thank you to Mason for allowing me to do this. It's fun to to do it again. It's been a long time since I've done this, and it's been really cool to get to know you more. So, you know, everyone out there, you know what I always used to say? I'm going to say it again right now. Say it with me. Get out there and have some fun. First of all, Thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun.